Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining this, the fourth session of Transform the Changing Consumer. My name is Peter Robbins, and I'm going to be your MC for today's session. And we have with us Grace Binchy, Aideen McCarthy, and David Cullen. As you may know, Transform is a new free online seminar series that explores the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. We'll be covering a total of six areas, ranging from the future of work to smart cities and communities, the circular economy, and many more. But today, our spotlight is squarely on consumer insights. And we're focusing a little on Ireland's food and drink market. This is Ireland's oldest, Ireland's biggest industry and our biggest employer. It's also a vibrant, dynamic hotbed of innovation. On the menu today, is not just a stimulating topic, but one brought to life by three of Ireland's foremost experts in the area. I've been fascinated with the topic of consumer insights for decades. Insights are the holy grail for businesses. How can you transform simple data or mere observations into insight? Insights resonate with people. They signal that the brand really understands me. Insights are penetrating observations that unlock business value and growth. Those who can read the weak signals from the market and convert them into penetrating actionable insight are the true business alchemists. So we're delighted to be joined today by three acknowledged leaders in this field. First, Grace Binchy, Insight Specialist in Bordbia, then Aideen McCarthy, founder of Insight Designed and until recently the head of insights for Kerry Foods, one of Ireland's biggest public companies with a turnover in excess of 7 billion. And finally, David Cullen, former head of Red Sea Research and now CEO of Opinion Research, who works with many of Ireland's leading firms and brands to unlock insights, which will help them achieve their ambitions for growth. So feel free to send in your questions during the session, but use the Q&A function. You'll find it at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that the chat function has been disabled, so only use the Q&A tab. We'll then compile the questions and I'll put them to Grace, Aideen and David, to and they'll address as many as they can in the time available. So I look forward to your questions, but with no further delay, I shall hand you over to Grace. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully there'll be no technical issues. Okay, that all working okay for everybody? Okay, good Perfect. afternoon, everybody. So as Peter said, we're going to, we're taking a three th uh, throng approach here. Um, I'm kicking off with trends and how trends lead to insight. Then Aideen talks about insight into innovation and David then uh, follows up talking about uh, innovation itself. So in terms of trends, I'm going to take you through how we work with trends, why we use trends, how we embed trends, and give you some examples of um, workshop tools that you can use to build trends for whatever projects you're working on. So why do we use trends? To quote a former or a past Roman emperor, Heraclitus, he talks about the only constant is change. To quote another former American army general, General Shinseki, he talks about if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So trends allow you to stay relevant. And this is about being relevant to your consumer. And we were only talking the other day, uh, Rory or uh, David, Aideen and myself about how 80% of businesses fail in the first two years. That's actually 90% when we're talking about the food industry. And one of the key reasons for failure is having a me too business, just another business that's doing the same thing. So there is a big question around, so the so what, and how do you make your business, your proposition relevant for the consumer? So trends allow you to create relevance and businesses that don't stay relevant, don't succeed. So really it's all about getting under the skin of your consumer, putting on your consumer shoes and really walking their walk and understanding them. And by being um, relevant, then you are more likely to succeed. Just to give you some of the examples of businesses that failed to use trends, that failed to adopt foresight. So here's a picture of a Kodak camera. Kodak, one of the biggest brands of the 20th century, 
failed to see the move and embrace the world of digital. And so having been at the top of the leaderboard, so to speak, in the world of cameras for the 20th century, their business went bankrupt in 2012. Blockbuster. Some of you might be too young to remember the world of VHS. It's hard to believe that there was a point in time where we used to go out and rent videos. And that was the highlight of our Friday nights or midweek nights. Blockbuster in 2000 were approached by a gentleman called Reed Hastings. And Reed Hastings was uh, responsible uh, for a starter business called Netflix. And he put a proposal to Blockbuster saying to them and suggesting that maybe they should go into partnership together and that they would promote Blockbuster online and that Blockbuster in turn would promote them in store. He was laughed out of the boardroom. Needless to say, things changed. And what happened here was Blockbuster failed to see the move into uh, the adoption of streaming services. And in 2012, their business um, saw the end of its story. Nokia, another brand that uh, was at the top of its game in the 90s, uh, they were the number one mobile phone brand. They saw themselves becoming the Kleenex of the tissue world, so to speak. And they failed to see the move from voice to data. And their hardware business was sold to Microsoft, I think it was in, in uh, 2014. So they're all examples of businesses that haven't tapped into understanding where the future is going and staying relevant. So now I'm briefly going to talk to you about what trends are and what they allow us to do. So trends, as you're getting a sense from me, allow us to look at sustained change over the medium term. So they look out three to five years from now. And they allow us to provide a framework to improve our understanding and make sense of how consumers' needs and wants are changing. So by using trends, they enforce us to behave in a very vigilant way around the world of our consumer. They enforce us to step check all the time, where are they going, what do they need, how are their needs changing. So it really um, allows us to have a discipline. They're also a source of inspiration, a source of inspiration. And really they can inform strategy at any level in the organization. So when we look at this onion, we look at the macro drivers of change being on the outer layer, which I'm gonna talk about shortly. Then you have your consumer trends. Then you move into consumer behavior, which really gets us into the area of insight. So the trends really feed into the world of insight, which Aideen is going to be talking about. You then look at a broad uh, competitive landscape and all those outer layers go to inform and help you think about how to develop your brand strategy, your shopper strategy, your business strategy and your innovation strategy. Trends also allow for the creation of a common language. So in terms of having a trends program within an organization, it allows people to speak the same thing in terms of who their consumers are. It allows for a transparent way of thinking and it's a more efficient way of working as well. A trend is not an insight. So as a trend allows us to look at longer term behavior over three to five years, whereas insights are much more shorter term behaviors. We have a lot of people who come to us with starter businesses uh, that I've worked with over time and they um, look at trends, which is absolutely fantastic. But just because their trend or their idea hits a trend, it doesn't mean it's a winner. And that's a really important thing. Trends are really about informing the groundwork or the foundations of whatever project you're working on. And they go, they feed into insight, they need to be explored and tested with consumers, and then they need to be validated and ultimately, they help inform a size of prize um, for whether you are going to hit um, the big time or not. So trends are an important part, as I say, of groundwork of any project. But a starting point, as if I go back to the onion layer, is to look at the macro drivers of change. So what are we talking about when we talk about the macro drivers? We're talking about everything from the social, economic, political factors that influence how we live. And in understanding those factors, we start to get a, a sense of how the world is changing and where the gaps are, where the sweet spots are in terms of how we can innovate around that. So we're looking at everything here from urbanization, aging populations, climate change. Just to give you an example, um, the percentage of the wealth of world's wealth owned by women in 2000 was 15%. By 2030, that figure will stand at 55%. So the women are really taking over, FYI, watch out all the men in the room. Um, but 55% of the world's wealth will be owned by women. So that's a phenomenal change. So that has huge implications then for how we look at our brands going into the future. And you know, we could talk about that for hours, but if you think about it, it could mean more independent single women. So changing demographic households or men not working in the home, maybe in the same way, 
or it creates a whole world of convenience convenience products and foods or more premiumized products and brands needing to talk to um, a higher net worth uh, female. Another stat here, the number of people who were obese in 2017, 650 million. By 2030, that figure will be at 1.1 billion. Again, you can imagine the implications that that's going to have on the health system. But in terms of foods and drinks that we might produce, as, as another example, it means creating foods that are healthier, encouraging people to eat better. Uh, so you can see it, how, how it could impact on so many different levels, ultimately um, landing with the pharmaceutical industry as well. This is a quote I really like from To Kill a Mockingbird. People generally see what they look for and hear what they listen for. They tend not to look for the unexpected, the unexplained or what's on the periphery. And what's really important when you're looking at trends is that you don't look at them in a linear way because success really comes from the marrying of different trends and from different trends coming together. And Airbnb presents a nice example of that. So when Airbnb was built, I suppose some of the trends that they would have been looking at on, it would, would have been shared ownership, the rise of digital um, being two. But actually one thing that they couldn't have factored in that has facilitated their success has been the aging population. So oh, what they have found is that the, the primary hosts who are buying into Airbnb are an elderly female cohort. So what's happened is you obviously have an aging population, you have people living longer, but with that, you have people who need to earn money in new and different ways. So actually Airbnb traditionally would have seen or at the outset would have seen that hotels would have been their main competitor, but actually they're now in a funny way competing with, with banks as well. So as I said, just to finish on the kind of evolution and, and where the trends fit in the process. So they are part of the groundwork once we've looked at our macro forces and then we can start developing the hypotheses that allow us to start thinking of potential opportunities for whatever areas of um, product or brand development that we might be trying to get into. And then we can explore and test those with consumers. And from there, we really need to start scoping out then, is there an opportunity here? Can I make something here that's commercially viable from this? And then ultimately that should give you the confidence to go out there and build whatever it is, your business or your brand or whatever. So just to kind of get to the next stage, I just wanted to show you our trends program within Board B. I'm absolutely not going through our old trends program at all, but just to show you what a trends program looks like and, and how we use it and how you could work with the tools within this program. So our consumer lifestyle trends program, Board B has been using since 2006, and they've got significant value out of it, working with everybody from small starter businesses right through to companies like Aideen worked with in, in Kerry Foods. So people have got value from this program throughout time. And again, for everything I've talked about from insight to innovation to um, product development communications plans. And really it's at the heart of our consumer thinking or it certainly is, is some of, um, sits very uh, neatly into the work that we do within the thinking house. So there are five, at the moment, there are five key trends that we work with, responsible living, community and identity, health and wellbeing, engaging experiences and compromised convenience. So just to show you, um, health and well-being, I suppose, just to give you the overarching explanation as we have it within our trends, is about eating and drinking and living to optimize my body systems to feel better than well today and tomorrow. So when we look at this trend, where it's at right now is very much about optimization and being our best self. And that, that also applies when we look at sustainability. We're really trying to be better people. We're much more in the era of the conscientious consumer. But when we look at trends, and this is the important thing for you to think about, is there are always a series of subtrends that sit under the overarching trend. And these subtrends are what evolve through time. And this is where we start to see things changing. So from our trends from last year, I think a build from work we've done, which uh, David would have helped us with um, in opinions, um, is shielding is becoming an emerging subtrend right now. So. This is uh, very much about defending and protecting our health. So it's really interesting to see the evolution. In recent years, we were very much in a proactive space in terms of our health management. And when we talk about systems health, which was one of the micro trends that I had there, that's all about using technology as an example to inform uh, how we look at our body as a series of component parts. So looking at everything from our sleep to our gut health to our brain health. And it was very much about being in the, the driving seat. But now the virus has put us in a place where we need to protect ourselves and defend ourselves. And with that, that has huge implications for how we approach food. Um, and we're seeing things like people buying more fruit and vegetables, people eating healthier for improved immunity through eating certain types of foods and just wanting to be to be well, I suppose. 
And then when we look at our trends and our subtrends, we always then look for examples of trends on the ground. So it's, there's kind of a three tiered approach to our trends. There's the macro forces, there's the trends, and then where we go out and look for, for the validation. And we have a streetscaping network that we use to help us do that, but we also do it ourselves. So if, again, if we look at systems health, um, stress, uh, chronic as a uh, chronic illness has emerged as something as very much 21st century illness. Um, sleep is kind of a, a fall off from that as a, as a challenge. So CBD is we're seeing as an ingredient that has really emerged in recent times and there are lots of products across a range of categories emerging uh, with CBD in them. Gut health, another systems health area that we're looking at, a market that's expected to grow to 70 billion by 2024. So we're really only scratching the surface. Um, and even at the research end, in terms of understanding what we can get from our gut and the whole learning around gut to brain health is something people still are learning now, but there's a whole world of biotics emerging. And the example here is of a Z biotic, which is a biotic for a hangover. So that's as distinct from a probiotic and a prebiotic, but it's something that is designed to tackle a hangover. So then when you look at examples for shielding, I think one example, it's not a food example, but Holland and Barrett have completely rejected their stores um, since COVID. They, they have found there was a huge surge in interest around in the area of immunity. So they have moved uh, all a whole range of products, over 250 products in this space to the front of their stores. Um, and you can also get a consultation uh, when you're in the store as well with somebody. So they're really uh, dialing up the needs people have in terms of concerns around health and trying to tackle immunity. Responsible living then, this is all about sustainability and about wanting to have a, a positive impact on my society and the environment and taking pride in that sustainable way of living. And I always say now when I present these trends, when I presented these trends early on, this was really kind of a nice to have. People kind of thought, oh yeah, we'll do something in the area of sustainability. This has really come front and center now. And um, there's a great quote from Ernest Hemingway where he says, gradually then suddenly. And I think both of these trends, but particularly this one is one that we're likely to see us embracing ever more. Um, in the years ahead, given all the challenges with climate. Um, the micro trends here are evolving all the time because there's so much exciting and dynamic things happening in this space. The most recent um, micro trend in this space is around waste control. And we do have one in here. So it's just a spin off from status waste and new waste makers. But what we found during COVID is as we're at home a lot more, we're cooking a lot more, there's a lot more of us around, we have a lot more waste. We're a lot more focused on it. We've also learned by slowing down that that has a positive benefit in the environment. And we've loads of stats to support that and how people here, just again, one of our stats from our indicator barometer is talking about how 32% of Irish adults say they're reducing food waste more since May. So there is that real concern around that. And with that, what it means is the consumers are gonna be looking for brands to help them think about ways to manage waste, make food go further for longer. And then we have a range of examples here. So the new alternatives include a whole range of exciting ingredients that are emerging in a whole new foods, a whole new language in this space. So this is a, a product, an ingredient called Solene from a business called Solar Foods. And it's a protein drive through gas-based fermentation. So it's very much carbon friendly and it can be used in powder form similar to flour. There's all sorts of things happening. Mushrooms as an example are emerging as a food that are uh, have the same taste and texture of meat. Um, so um, they're particular mushrooms that are being used uh, to replace that over time. So lots of exciting things happening there. And then in the waste maker space, I thought I'd put this in. Some of you may have seen them. They were on the ear to the ground the other night, the Mead family. And um, they are obviously potato, a potato company, um, but they have recently introduced a new innovation process in terms of a starch extraction process in their business. And what they do is they take the potatoes that aren't fit for the food chain anymore and turn them into a healthy, healthy food manufacturing ingredient. And what they were seeing and tracking was that the starch market was one that was, has been in growth in recent years because it's been used in sustainable packaging, meat-free and sugar-free foodstuffs. So it's a really, really, um, in terms of viability and size of prize and all the rest, they're really up there. So I just, to finish off of examples of some uh, templates that you can use if you want to work with trends. So here is what we call our trend safari capture sheet. And this is really simple here. This really is a sheet that highlights all the key trends as, as we have them right now. And uh, you can just take this and go out there if you're trying to understand about a particular category, a particular type of business and explore uh, that category and take photos and pictures. You can be your own streetscaping network. Uh, you don't need any to, fancy people or fancy title to, to do that work. You can just do it yourself. Take lots of photos and pictures. And it's always, again, this idea of thinking laterally, looking across different categories. So if you're in the world of food and you're you know, working in the world of chocolate, why not look at the world of teas just to see how they're packaging their products, the language they're using, all those kinds of things give you stimulus to think about uh, things in new ways. 
this pipeline pressure test is really uh, about, as I was saying earlier on, allowing you to be vigilant and process driven in terms of how you think about how you're embedding trends in your business. So it allows you again to take all the trends and think about what are we doing now? What are we doing next? And what might we do in the future? Might seem like really obvious stuff, but it's the really obvious and kind of diligent stuff that allows you to start really identifying where there are opportunities. And this one here is another good example of that. So assuming you're working in a world where you have a category, a portfolio of products that you're dealing with, and this allows you to plot out uh, your products um, within your portfolio and understand where you're strong and where you're weak and allows you to identify then potential sweet spots uh, for innovation. This then is a summary, and I think my last, uh, my second last slide, uh, that is a lovely sheet to work with because it kind of brings everything together that you've been doing. So it allows you to look at what the macro drivers are that are driving the trend. It looks where you're getting your inspiration from to jot down the consumer attitudes. And then it allows you to understand how you could apply this trend to your business, gets you to focus in on who exactly your consumer is, and that allows you really to kind of flesh out what your idea might be. And lastly, again, back to this idea of kind of lateral thinking and merging the trends. This is a great exercise in pulling the trends together. So if, for example, you were to uh, clash responsible living and uh, health and wellness, that allows you to start thinking in a more holistic and enhanced way around what you could do with your products and brands. So for example, if it, you were creating a drink um, and maybe it was a health drink, maybe your packaging simply is recycled, has recycled content or is compostable. So you're bringing different kind of trends together and addressing needs that create a product that's more relevant for the consumer of today. So that is it from me. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to Aideen. Thanks a million, Grace. Fascinating stuff. And um, yes, Aideen, welcome along. Thank you. I am going to do my sharing now. Yes. Okay, we get all this on one. Trying to see the top of my screen right now. Is there any chance that panel can be lifted purely so I can get into slide share? Maybe me now. Sorry, Aideen, what's your problem? I just get into slide share, please, um, Molly, um, because the top of the panel have there. Any control of your screen, but um, purely can, the top. I can't see the. You can't click into the slideshow, can you? Uh, it's nor It's just hiding that panel at the top, Aideen, sorry, so I can see. If you, if you stop sharing go to slide share and then scroll to the bottom of your screen and bring zoom back up and uh, okay. and you can slide share you can share your slides from there that definitely works for me oh wait now i'm i'm getting there yeah we're good super oh perfect okay so um Peter, like you, I am a bit of an insight junkie and I have been addicted to consumer insights for the last 20, 25 years. And for me, it's a passion in terms of how insights are gathered, how insights are used, the skills that it takes to become insightful and then how that can trigger growth or trigger strategy. So let me go on to the next one. I'm just trying to go to my next slide. Here we go. So in front of you there, there's three big hairy numbers, as I call them, 13, 70% and 10%. So the number 13 represents, on average, the tools that brands use to gather data. That's 13 different tools to gather different sources of information. Now that number 13 can rise to 30 if you're talking about big companies, big, large corporations. 70% is the average time people use trawling through data to find information. And then 10% is that time that marketeers use to be able to translate that information into insight. 
So there's a big question there. Are we using insights and using information and are we using our time in the right way? And one of the questions, and we, I always look, look, are we facing data tyranny, but also lacking wisdom at the same time? Because having so much information does not mean we are wise, does not mean we have a lot of knowledge, does not mean we're using that information in the right way. And I always use this slide and I've used it for about five or six different presentations because I think it really represents how data can be used in the wrong way. So this was predicted to be, and I'll use the words there, an amazeballs innovation back in 2019. The investors in Silicon Valley were going, Genie, this makes absolute sense. You have a phone and you have a fork. And that actually represents millennials' behaviour. So what happened here was that we had designers that looked at social media and also observed what millennials were doing when they're eating. The majority of millennials were scrolling through their phones and eating at the same time. Now, when you look at that observation, it makes perfect sense. Well, wouldn't it be a great innovation to just put a fork on a spoon and bingo, we'll have a fantastic innovation that's going to be amazeball successful. The reality is this was an almighty flop. And I'm going to go back to what Grace said there earlier. Trends, do not mean insight. Data and observation do not mean insight. So what happened here is that the guys did not test the prototype. They didn't validate it. They didn't go into the reality of millennials' lives to see was it adding value to their lives? Was eating a better, a better experience for them? And was looking at their phone more enjoyable? It wasn't, hence the failure. So then I always reflect and go, well, isn't there a big question that we need to be more efficient with their information? We need to evolve and ask and use the right information in the right way to provoke the right action. So having loads of information does not necessarily mean that it provokes the right action, nor does it mean that it means to be insightful. And as I said earlier, that is important. It feeds information, it feeds insight, but it only can take us so far. Data does not let us get underneath the skin of behavior, of the complexities of human life, of being really able to see what the genuine unmet needs of consumers are. And one great example, and this is a classic example of a brand that brought insights to life really, really well by truly understanding their target audience. And this was Dove, the real beauty campaign. So here on the left-hand side, you'll see these images really depict youth, perfection, image-friendly, Instagram, that beauty meant perfection. And it was very, very aspirational. However, there was a lot of frustration with normal everyday women that this brand did not speak to them. This brand did not understand them. And therefore, the brand was losing relevance and losing um, genuine contact and genuine understanding of the bigger consumer and the real women. So they created the campaign and they were able to shift from perfection to giving women permission to be themselves, giving women the permission to be real. And this allowed the brand to start gaining back growth in double digit. And this real Dove, um, this Dove beauty campaign has lasted over the last 15 years. And again, I'm going to go back to what Grace said earlier, you have to be relevant. Perfection is no longer relevant. Skinny is no longer relevant. It's all about being strong, being authentic and being yourself. And this brand was able to really disrupt the beauty industry and give, as again, women the permission of being real, being themselves, and therefore the brand, as I said, grew triple fold. And the key big idea behind this was that every woman has the right to feel beautiful in her own way. So imagine how powerful that was in shifting the paradigm from perfection, again, to permission to be real. 
So taking into account those big three figures that I mentioned earlier on, 13 different tools to look at insight, 70% of our time spent going through information and only 10% used to translate that into action. How can we evolve and elevate insights to really drive growth and inspire action? So I have five key points here I'll share with you. One, it's all about using the whole brain. And I'm sure all of you know this in terms of the difference between the left brain and the right brain. So I'll go through it. Typically, big organizations are logical, they're analytical, they're driven by data. And that makes sense. You have to have evidence to prove what you're going to influence, what you're going to change, and what you're asking investment for. However, the world has changed, and we're looking at bigger picture, really understanding how consume, what consumers need, what the unmet needs are, how to get beyond the obvious. And there's a lot more experimentation in terms of solving human needs. A whole brain also allows us to be future, th future thinkers and future-proof our decisions. Being a whole brain thinker de-risks innovation because you're able to see in front, you're able to look around those corners and, be, and with insight and with knowledge, being able to demonstrate to the organization that there are a lot of other unobvious um, scenarios ahead. And the big, big idea here is to start celebrating right brain creativity. And there's no time in COVID that we've seen organizations having to be creative in order to survive. The second one, and again, I'll refer back to you, Grace. I keep referring to you, Grace, but that's a good thing. <laughs> it's being able to use different sources of information to be able to pull from the unobvious that we can really drive creative thinking and unlock new, fresh insights that drive change. Okay. One of the key things, the second thing here, is I always say, I heard, I read, I saw, I think, I feel, I believe. If we can start using that as a jumping point to think about insights and how they clash together, how they make sense, it allows us to constantly reframe what are the actual needs of our, those consumers? What are they not saying to us? How do we express the unarticulated? And it really is important to start challenging assumptions. Big thing in terms of insight, insight comes from everywhere. It is not just one person in an organization. It is not just one source of information. It has to be a combination of different sources. And it's all about setting the right conditions. People need to feel that their voice is as equal to anybody else in a room, as equal to anybody sharing research. And that's why empathetic research is really, really important to be able to really understand what consumers are not are not aware of themselves and get into that unconscious. One of the things again is shared vocabulary. Sometimes, and look Jeannie, I've done this plenty of times before, us insights people can be full of fancy language and that's fine. But actually in order to tra translate a really good insight into clear, concise meaning, it has to be simple and it has to be in language that everybody understands in the organization. That common language, that shared vocabulary allows insights and ideas being able to be translated from one department to another, especially with insight, because it is a very creative technique. Those ideas need to be passed to R&D people that typically are very science orientated. One of the big things to be insightful um, in an organization is for everyone to feel that they are safe. There is no um, vehicle for learning unless people feel safe. And that psychological safety is again, is really, really important to start sharing insights and passing them from one idea, um, one department to another and making sure that they're understood um, by everybody. And I think David will talk about this as well in terms of the role of innovation being user centric and solving problems. And we are moving now, and I'm delighted to see it, moving into a world where solving problems and innovation needs to be people led, not product led. And empathy, and again, this is a big word that is coming up. I see it so many times in emails and articles um, everywhere. Empathy, how do we really relate to those people that we want to solve problems for, the people that are our target audience. And we may think we understand them, 
but it takes a lot of skill to be insightful and uncover those unconscious needs that consumers have. And this is where emotion and reality unite. In order to be insightful, have to be logical, but also the emotion and join those up. And one of the key things is being able to look beyond data and being able to step out of our own biases and observation. One of the key reasons that the phone, the spoon, spoon phone uh, failed was because the designers had their own biases. They, according to them, this is a great idea. Their observations allow them to go, this is a great idea, we're going to go with it. However, if they had uncovered what the reality of that eating experience looked like in people's kitchens, they may have come or they would have come with a different conclusion. So again, human centricity is not just about our own consumers, but it's about ourselves as well. And finally, it's really, really important to have a framework to be able to bring an organization through the insight journey. And it is an organizational journey. Um, it's a necessary evil. The word process can really go, oh my God, is this going to kill creativity? Is this going to kill how those ideas are going to come to the surface? Not at all. It's all about being able to find the right information and being able to have a step-by-step -step approach in terms of translating that information into action. The other important point of a process as well, or framework, is that your stakeholders have a logical, clear line of vision as to, as to what you've done and what you are doing. Okay. Um, so the benefits of insight to trigger strategy and being insightful, they're absolutely massive. There's a load of list of them, but it's all about being user led human led on what your consumer actually needs rather than what your business wants to do. It future proofs, which means that information is used in the right way. You are de-risking innovation, saving a lot of time and money. And it's all about bringing collective wisdom and collective wisdom in an organization is huge, not only from building knowledge, but also everyone participating in the journey, feeling part of it. And it's a team sport. And again, as I mentioned, in terms of future proofing, Insight and insight process gives you long term savings and actually accelerates speed to market. And this is a quote, one of my favorite quotes that I wish I had to come up with myself, but I haven't and I don't know who has. But for insights to drive strategy and insights to be used to drive innovation, there is an absolute great future ahead. And this quote is that the insight that you deliver drives us up our game to set challenges, question your assumptions, shift paradigms and change the world. So we're talking about insight. We don't deliver research, we deliver enlightenment. And finally, it's very slow there. And that enlightenment triggers the business to act and move forward. And that's it from me. Thanks a million, Aileen. Um, very stimulating and some very, um, interesting ideas. A, a couple of people have put questions in and, and uh, obviously your, some of your, um, Grace and yourself, the ideas that you're promoting in, in the talks or alluding to are triggering some questions for people. So I would encourage the audience to keep thinking and fire them into the Q&A. Um, but right now I'd like to introduce uh, David Cullen, CEO of Opinions Research. Thanks, David. Okay, thank you, Peter, um, and thank you, Pierre Angelo, Molly, um, for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I guess uh, Peter, as I'm sure many of you know, is kind of a, a leader in the development and application of design thinking for innovation, um, which is what I'm going to attempt to take you through in the next 20 minutes. But I'm going to not do it justice from a pure academic perspective, and I'm going to try to break this down into a simple um, an explanation as I can make it in three simple key stages and three principles that I want you to take away from today. Um, the application of design thinking uh, has become much more prevalent in recent times. And certainly in the work that we do, it has crept in over a period of the last two to three years to become almost the accepted way um, to do innovation. And in order to, to bring this to life for you, I'll take you through three very basic uh, principles. Um, the first thing, just to remind ourselves all the time, and this is where really design thinking takes off, 
is that innovation is fundamentally about solving problems. So I think once you come into a forum like this and we start talking about innovation, everybody's thinking about new products and thinking about Apple and so on. But innovation can be, you know, relatively small process changes, changes to supply chain and so on. It's about expressing a particular problem and working to develop a solution to solve that. That's it at its simplest uh, in terms of what innovation is all about. And I guess we shouldn't lose sight of that in terms of the application of insight for this, because fundamentally what we're trying to understand from a consumer's perspective or from another audience of customers, clients or other stakeholders is really what is their problem. That is the fundamental first starting pr principle that we need to um, concentrate on. And quite often it's a challenge to get businesses that we deal with to give the requisite time to thinking about the problem they're trying to solve. And when it works at its best, you would, you would typically spend half of your time expressing the problem, recognizing the problem, fine tuning the essence of what the issue is that you're trying to solve, and then half the time coming up with the solution. And that is rarely people's instinct. People want to jump into solutions and do cool stuff and you know make nice products and uh, act on their hunches and so on. But really, we have to keep reminding ourselves in the world of innovation, we're about solving problems and we have to be very clear and very specific in terms of our expression of that problem. And for that reason, the insight in terms of the definition of what insight is all about, there are multiple different alternative uh, definitions. If you just Google definition of insight, you'll come up with 20 or 30 different um, expressions of it. For me, in the, in the world of innovation, this is the definition that works for me. A constraint, the discovery of a constrained human need or desire that can be resolved and hopefully profit, profitably. So if you think about what's, what that statement is all about and what it means, this is about two things. First of all, we are recognizing and discovering a human need. So we're very clearly expressing that this is a human uh, empathy as, as Aideen put it, we're being empathetic to a human need. We're identifying clearly what it is that they need to achieve, but also recognizing that that need is currently constrained. The achievement of that need and um, their ability to resolve that particular need is currently constrained. That's our job is to remove that constraint, to resolve that problem and to eliminate that challenge from their lives and um, from a consumer's perspective. So that to me is what insight is all about. So insight is not a fact. It's not taking a piece of data and saying 60% of men think this, 50% of women think this. That is, you know, very often you hear on the radio and I'm shouting at the radio people saying, oh, we got a piece of insight that told us 60% of people said X or Y. That is not insight. Insight is about the distillation of multiple facts, data points, observations, conversations you have or used to have on bar stools, you know, have on Zoom or whatever with friends and family you should be trying to assimilate multiple different data points, uh, observations, and so on. A lot of the work we do is in the world of FMCG. And I know that Grace is in, the, in a similar space in Borbia. And I would obsessively walk around supermarkets and observe how people are shopping, observe what they're looking for in relation to products, look at how things are priced in terms of the psychology of price points and so on, and to look at new products as they become available on shelf. What are they responding to? What has fed that particular um, you know, idea from that business? And it is about having a constant curiosity and um, should be fueling your insight bank. And you might be walking around with multiple insights popping into your mind um, and they can hit you at unexpected times. But really the way to structure your thinking around this is to think about a very, very simple sentence that you're trying to complete here fill in the blanks. They want dot, 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 but they can't get it. So I'll give you an example. I'll give you multiple examples in a minute, but just as it happens to be to hand, I have a can here of a, of a product called Runa. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it. It's inverted anyway, but this is a, an energy drink, but it's the first one that's kind of cracked uh, the total natural ingredients, right? And if you look, there's another one. So Tenzing, so obviously I was doing drink in the world of, uh, or, or in the world of beverages or whatever. So this is another one, Tenzing. 
And clearly the, the want and the but here is that people needed energy to get through the day, but they didn't want the additives and sugar content of traditional energy drinks. So that is an insight in itself and leads to the development of an entire proposition around more natural um, energy drinks. I have other examples of products here that you could pick up and you know, would it be an interesting exercise for yourself whenever you're looking at or thinking about this afterwards is to look at products on shelf and try to retrofit what might the insight have been there, what might be the tension that they are trying to resolve in relation to that particular product. Um, so that's the, fir the first thing I guess is, is insight in our one, one, two, three. And as I said, these insights are about observing, listening, triangulating different data points. So you have data points coming from Nielsen and Cantor, the trends programs, the work that Grace does in Bourbea is phenomenal. You can go on there, there's free access online to lots of the trends programs that they run. Even to look at them, flick through them as a coffee table book to try to stimulate thinking are fantastic and triangulate your own assumptions, your own data points against those, um, and then committing them to a sentence. And that's often the hard thing, but if you can commit to a sentence, it becomes your North Star, it guides everything that you do subsequently and keeps everybody on track. And if you imagine in a commercial setting, trying to get your financial teams, your supply teams, your manufacturing teams, all on board, they can all congregate around this shared understanding of an insight, this single, um, sentence that you've articulated that captures the essence in a simple way, as Aideen alluded to, and um, what this is all about. So you might look at, you know, even trying to think about these human needs in terms of head, heart, and hand. So is this a, something that's a very tangible need? So I'm thinking here about veganism. So let's say, what is the story with veganism? Quarter of all uh, meals that were presented in supermarket shelves in the first six months of 2020 carried a claim that they were meat-free or vegan. Imagine that, a quarter of all product launches and 4% of the population are vegan. So what, what's the story there? So what are people looking for? So you start to look what rationally they're looking for. It might be about living longer and that sort of healthier life. It may be about feeling that they're part of a gang. So it's part of my identity. I'm part of the vegan movement. I'm in, I'm hip, I'm cool or whatever. Um, or in terms of their experience or being it may be just about experimentation, just doing interesting stuff, trying something new. But what is behind that from a human perspective? It can be rational, can be experiential, it can be emotional. So think about your insights in those terms. It doesn't always have to be solving a, a, you know, a, t a tangible physical problem. It can be about feelings um, and experiences too. It's just something to think about. Um, importantly, you should involve others in this uh, process, I guess, um, in terms of, of coming up with these. So speak to consumers, speak to colleagues, customers, clients. Focus groups are great. As you know, in this world, in this environment now with COVID, we're a little constrained, but we've developed solutions that we can do uh, workshopping often more effectively through digital channels like this um, and other platforms. So it's not an excuse not to go out and do things um, observation is absolutely fine as well. One to ones conversation with you know people in the appropriate target group that you happen to know, they are equally valid in terms of their perceptions. Another thing I'll just say, and again, twenty minutes is quite uh, limited to to get through a lot of this stuff. We could spend days on it, to be honest. But you know, really, um, mind mapping is a wonderful um, discipline. Uh, it's something that. While the drawing here shows you what a mind map might look like, very few people have the time or the discipline to actually draw them. So my, I mind map in my mind as opposed to mind mapping on a page necessarily, but it's a way of thinking. So for instance, if I was trying to tackle a problem, we've expressed what our problem is. So let's say it's um, obesity. I might then start to think in circles coming out from that. So my first branch coming off that obesity big problem is going to be what are the needs and wants that are relevant to that particular challenge. My next branch might be about what's the tension, what is the but, what is the thing that is constraining people's ability to get to where they want to get to in relation to obesity. And then my next layer of the onion is about solutions. So what might solve each of those particular problems? And I think that simple three-tier mind map um, is very effective way of shaping your own brain to think 
or in, even better if you do have the time to draw it out. But I think three tiers is enough. Um, but I think fundamentally need tension solution is the three step, very simple. Um, so apologies, uh, Peter, for making it so reductive in terms of design thinking. I know there's much more to it, but for a basic 20 minute introduction, those three fundamentals are critically what I would look at. So moving on to the second one of these, what's holding them back? What are the barriers um, to their attainment of that particular need? We need to look at that barrier and express that uh, succinctly and clearly so that we're, we're identifying one problem. This doesn't become, you know, they want to, uh, you know, become the next supermodel, but 10 different things, bang, 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 are holding them back. We want to concentrate on one. And that one thing should obviously be something that we can help with. So it's not much good if it's not something our business is involved in or that we're ever going to stand any chance of resolving or helping with. Um, so from that point of view, it should be something you can help with. Uh, again, a few slides in here, <clears throat> just showing these types of, of uh, visuals of groups. Get together with people. Ro you know, it's very, very easy to sit in a darkened room and to convince yourself that your perspective is right on something. You're rarely going to challenge yourself appropriately. You're rarely going to think you're wrong without somebody else offering that challenge to you. So you simply have to share these things. And I would say share them as early as possible and get somebody involved with you. In an academic context, do these things as a group. Don't say in a group project, for instance, I'm going to go off and do the insight bit. Somebody else go off and do the solution bit. It is an ecosystem, you know, where we you have to collaborate um, on these things and to respect everybody's perspective because an insight is an inexact science. Um, I'm not going to say it's quite an art, but I'll call it an inexact science. Uh, nobody has the right or wrong answer necessarily, so you have to respect others' opinions. So involve groups all the time as best you can. So I want to just look at a few examples really quick. I'm very conscious of my, my time here, so I don't run over. Um, but uh, you know, if we think about Harley Davidson, I'll give you a few examples. I showed you Tenzing and Runa there as well. But like, if you look at Harley Davidson, men, men in their midlife still want adventure with mates. Right? A simple fact, but nonetheless, potentially a very insightful um, rec recognition um, for this organization to make in terms of what matters to the people that they're trying to sell stuff to. They're not trying to sell to younger people because their bikes are too dear. They're also, you know, visually, they're of the, of the past of a particular era. So they're not going to unrealistically start to target, uh, you know, young men or whatever. So they recognize who their target is. So look at it, this very simple statement that seems that there's nothing to it. This is identifying whose problem they're trying to solve. They're trying to solve a problem for men in midlife, middle-aged men. The problem they're trying to solve here is that they want adventure. But the tension is that life gets in their way. So in order to overcome that, Harley Davidson, you know, totally reframed its proposition away from just being we sell motorbikes. It was much more experiential, setting up groups, setting up online communities to allow people to identify, connect with one another and to develop their own groups of middle aged men just like them who wanted adventure that could meet up and to fulfill their perhaps childish to some people um, goals of adventure and go off on group bike rides and so on. It's a very different direction um, that it took as a consequence. Again, if we look at Dove here, and I've put a little caveat on the bottom of all of these saying this is entirely made up with an explanation mark. I'm trying to retrofit some stuff here based on assumptions. But to Aideen's example here, women want to feel body confident with Dove. But beauty is often a source of anxiety. Right. So we recognize here, yes, this is what the challenge. This is what uh, women want to feel body confident. The challenge or the constraint here is that beauty is often a source of, source of anxiety. Other women criticizing them, you know, constantly being confronted with images of perfection and so on. So that's the type of uh, insight that may underpin a brand like Dove. If we move on to something like Walmart. Uh, US, I know, but I just love it as a brand in terms of how it's invented uh, or how it's reinvented itself con constantly. 
But if you think about what Walmart's all about, and we have some equivalents here in the discounters and so on, but ordinary folks want the same stuff as rich people, right? There's an insight for you that is not particularly, uh, you, you know, you're not going, whoa, that's something I've never thought of before. But when you see it written down, it's very directive in terms of where this might take you as a brand. So I recognize now that my challenge as Mr. Walmart is to try to address this constrained desire that the ordinary folk that come through my door want the same stuff as rich people, but they can't afford it. So what do I do? I go and I create rich people's uh, experiences. I go and create cheaper variants of different things that rich people enjoy as well in Walmart. And they're exceptionally good at that. You can buy $5 lobsters, you can do all the stuff that rich people do. And they take this to, to heart in a, in a big, big way. You could look at other store, the stores in America are great for it in terms of Whole Foods and Mariano's and so on. You can look almost going in the door, you can see the insight that's driving this organization is you know X or Y because they're so stratified and so clearly on strategy. And it's wonderful to see um, in the States how close to strategy and how clear to, clearly aligned to strategy um, some of these brands are. Um, Avoca is one case in point in, in Ireland. You know, one of the very uh, insightful things that I have seen in relation to brands here is Avoca saying that we are here for mums with their mums. So if you think about that, you walk in the door next time into Avoca and you think about this whole experience is made for mums with their mums. So the cakes are massive, the big slices. They're made to share. You know, the cups of coffee are big. They're made to sit down and have a proper conversation. The gifts are either for young kids or they're for older ladies typically. The whole experience is about mums and their mums. And that's where insight can drive strategy, innovation, your whole product ranging and so on from a retail perspective. So fascinating to see it. But again, as you go into shops, try to have a think about what might be the insight fueling this. If you look here at, at Nike as well, weekend warriors, so people like me probably, or any of you that are out jogging and having a run around, want to look like athletes, but they don't have time to put in the work. So we're gonna wear super cool athletic clothes so we look the part whenever we're out for our morning jog or whatever. So who knows what's behind it? Look at Expedia. Uh, you know, they, their whole campaign was travel yourself interesting. So an insight here is probably something that 20 somethings want their mates to think they're interesting. You know, sounds super simple, sounds kind of stupid, really, but absolutely true. You know, you hear the tales of people coming back from Australia and from Peru and everywhere else, and you want to be part of that. You want people to think you're interesting, but they don't know how. So Expedia curate different travel experiences, great places to go that are accessible to young people and so on. And um, so you can start to unpick different brands. And again, I'm making these things up, but it just gives you a flavor for how um, strategy can be driven by the power of just one sentence, which is your insight. And in particular, how innovation can be driven by it. And that's where we move on to the final part of the puzzle here in terms of the, the, the part three of this, um, one, two, three. So this is about where we burn the problems, where we basically, yes, we acknowledge that statement like we've just expressed there. We have our succinct desire, constrained desire, um, and we know it's something we can do something about. So this is where it gets to be a bit of fun. We start to get into solution mode. How are we going to resolve these problems for people? And, and fundamentally, again, to be a, to take a very reductive view on this, this is fundamentally about ideate, test, iterate. So uh, as, as Aideen alluded to with the fork and the, and the thing, they ideated, so they came up with an idea. They didn't test this. They didn't then, after testing it, iterate it and go back and say, that was a load of crap, or the feedback I got was very bad, so I'm going to go back and rethink that idea or whatever. That, those second two phases didn't happen. They're critical in the process, um, as that example will, will attest to. And I'm going to just show you, because I don't have time to go through them, I'm going to show you a load of models, materials, and um, different uh, resources that you can access yourself if this is an area you're interested in, in, in innovation, in particular design thinking. And just to fundamentally say that they all follow much the same sort of process. You've got a fuzzy front end where all the research is done, the mad ideas are happening, you're trying to 
unpick what's the insight, what's the constraint here, what's the challenge, what are the ones we can do something about. Then you're into concepts and development of prototypes. And sometimes prototypes aren't physical prototypes. Sometimes they are propositions written on a page. Sometimes they go as far as design scamps, as they're called in the industry, of having you know uh, designers go and create how this might look. And very often in my world, and I'll show you some examples of this, I would bring with me uh, a visualizer um, who is a visual artist comes along with me to sessions that I'm doing. And as we're having a conversation with consumers, we'll be sketching out in cartoon form exactly the products that they're describing. So I'll show you some examples of those in a second. Um, that's fundamentally all of them follow those core principles. And it is the fun part, but again, it has to be done collaboratively in groups. Yeah, absolutely. Anything goes here, blue sky. And you sometimes find that the very best ideas are things that whenever they're floated in a room are dismissed as being insane, bananas, never gonna do that. But within the direction of travel that that, in, that idea indicates, there is a kernel of something interesting that if you tone it back from the madcap idea, it becomes something that's more credible, something that has greater potential um, to succeed. So as I said, um, we're just going to help with the visualization. I'll show you two examples. Um, I have two minutes to go. Um, on the visualization, here's an example of something we were working on on Flower. It was about setting. It was about supporting communities of bakers working together from Odlums, as you can see there in the right hand side, little picture of Odlums. This was they were talking about, you know, uh, groups on WhatsApp or whatever. So my visualizer, who was with me, sketched these out live as I was talking. On a recent beverage study, here we see a whole better for you proposition. They were sketching out here. Inducive is the name they came up with for this. Uh, it was honey sweetened, so you see little bees on it and so on. But, you know, very um, useful way of doing it where you can see things come to life live in the group. Put it on the table. What do you think now that you see it working? And here we see some wonderful packaging ideas. So, you know, this goes into real life uh, production or into a business or whatever that pack may be the inspirational moment, the color of it may be the inspirational moment, the font, the simplicity, the clarity of the visual um, helps to bring to life what that group was talking about. And um, so highly recommend it to, that you include some form of visualization. And then to Aideen's point again, that you test it. Um, you know, we have all sorts of systems. We're a research company first and foremost. So we have all sorts of systems for testing, scorecards that you can see here, for example, um, on the screen. Um, and I just direct you to one study that is available on Board Bia's website on beverage futures. And the reason I'm saying it is because it talk, takes you through a real life example of this process, which has trends up front. It has a distillation of those into insights, a distillation of those insights into potential futures, and then quantitative testing of those. So it's kind of an end to end process, freely available in the public domain. The link is there on the, on the slide as well. Um, and just to say there are loads of toolkits out there. If this is an area for you, um, loads of toolkits, some of which Peter was involved in the development of um, as well. Uh, so just again, just to reiterate that you have an expert at your disposal in Peter uh, as well in this area. But some of these toolkits are in this deck as well. You can see here um, the, uh, one from the Institute of Design at Stanford. You'll notice as you go through these, they're all very, very similar to be frank. Um, there's empathize, define the problem. So coming back to my insight thing, focus on what the problem is. Think about it as writing the brief to yourself. Then you're into ideation. This is where Aideen's example stopped. They just came up with the idea. You have to then prototype it, test it, go back again. So that's the basic process. This is the design council um, alternative, which is very, very much the seminal um, design thinking uh, framework in terms of discovering, which is empathy out there searching, define the problem, develop solutions, deliver um, to the market. So that's really what that's about. And then one just developed down the road in DCU um, with, by Frank Devitt. Uh, again, Peter, some involvement in this, um, a more holistic approach, I guess, to it, but fundamentals remain the same in terms of those steps along the journey. So I'm sorry, I'm one minute over time. So sorry about that. A couple of others there with links that if you want to see them, and um, by all means, go and have a look. Okay. David, thanks a million. Um, 
I'm sure everyone will agree that, that was um, a, a jam-packed full of um, experience and very it's extraordinarily helpful. From the presentations, I can get a sense that um, some th you know anybody listening will hear there are some very uh, clear themes coming through. One I think is begins with Grace's piece about um, being consonant with the trends. I don't think you can go you know if there's a trend towards home fermentation or protein you're unwise to go against uh, the trend. So the first thing I suppose is to know the, um, the overarching uh, gestalt of what's going on. The second thing that comes up for, with all of you is it's a, it's a team sport and it's a group. And um, as uh, Aideen said, I think that, um, or maybe Grace, sorry, the people see what they're looking for. And that's true. I think you have to torture test your ideas with a group of people, some of whom will be skeptical. Um, I liked your model of the, you know, people who have needs and wants, but there is some constraint. And therefore, if you can unlock that, then you've got, you're in the space of, of uh, solutions. And then the fact that it's all distilled, that um, there's always another layer to go down. You know, uh, when I worked in uh, GSK, we called it the insight elevator. So there's some functional insights about how you do things and packaging and stuff like that. And then there's some universal insights about the stuff you talked about, about well-being and living longer and being your best self. But let me just ask you, um, a couple of good questions have come in. Um, maybe Grace, if I could start with you, um, because it's clear that we can see signals in the marketplace. If you see um, everything from, you know, social, sociological, anthropologically um, evident things, uh, like people wearing tattoos or something like that. It's a weak signal of something. I'm not gonna ask you now to interpret it or anything, but one of the questions is, how far out are you looking and what gives you certainty that it's real and maybe you can, and, and it's worth one of your client companies um, investing or engaging or building a brand, uh, uh, some kind of proposition on it. Okay. Uh, so firstly, how far out? So we talk about three to five years. I think there was reference there to w, WGSN looking at two to four years. It's that kind of time frame. You know, you're, you're kind of beyond two years plus anyway for your, your future that you're looking at. In terms of knowing whether it's real or not, it's kind of a combination of all the things that we've been talking about throughout this presentation. So you form a hypothesis based on your trends. You have to collaborate, work with people, go out and explore, you know, is this happening? Is there something real in this? If you're coming up with, just to go back to drinks and David's examples there, if you're coming up with a new drink then, um, you have to do your desk research, as Aideen said, filter through, although that 70% figure is terrifying, um, but do your desk research as well. You work with your teams, you develop your, your concepts, as David would have showed you, and then you test them. So that's, you're in the test stage then, and then you go into a reiteration. And the test stage may, may involve, we're lucky, as David said, we've access to uh, all these different research tools that we can use. So ideally speaking, you get in front of your consumers, and um, that all informs your, your product, your insight, um, and at that point, you can go to your board or whoever, whatever the way that the question was put in there, and you could be confident that you have something. But it's not, the trends cannot, they, as I said at the start, they don't mean you're onto a winner. There's a lot of work to do. You know, they're only part of the groundwork, and they allow you to form a hypothesis, which should bring you in the right direction. Um, and I think that collaborative piece, as Aideen and David said, is absolutely hugely important. Um, and, uh, and then testing your ideas with consumers. And can I just to add to that, I suppose, just in, in terms of, and again, the beverage example is a good one, but if you look back, and sometimes it's useful to look back on trends presentations that were done 10 years ago and look at them and say, did this happen? Did something close to this happen? And invariably, it doesn't happen exactly as it was expected to, but some version of that weak signal, as you put it, Peter happens. So if it's something about belonging and safety and um, being a, a big trend or whatever, it may manifest itself in different ways, but albeit that that thread runs through it. So health and wellness is one in particular. It's in every trends thing that I've looked back in 20 years, and it's always the number one or whatever. People's individual well-being is a fundamental human uh, need and desire that they have, but how that manifests changes over time. So the trend you know, maybe about an, in one period of time, maybe about strength. And I remember, you know, four or five years ago, there was a thing about strong as the new skinny for women in particular. And that was a manifestation of health and wellness. 
but it became an absolute truth in terms of the products that you saw, in terms of the visuals that were used to, to sell products and so on for, for women. So that being that, at the, at the moment, there's a lot about that, as you say, the shielding grace. So it's more, in my view, the expression of the trend and getting that right, yeah. rather than the underlying trend, which are generally quite uh, fundamental um, human needs as opposed to how their expressions change over time. So that expression of strong being the new skinny is kind of had its time. Now we're into shielding. Um, you know, gut health is probably the next thing to come in relation to that. So I think it's more how do we unpick the relevant expressions of that trend because the trends won't and shouldn't change all that often, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, a quick question maybe to Aideen around yeah. um, because part of our series is to investigate how digital technology helps fuel this stuff. And sometimes I can imagine, you could imagine, say, again, in society, uh, there's a continuum between the people who stormed Capitol Hill, somebody who wrote a letter to the Irish Times as a signal of uh, discontent about how society is going, someone else who talks in a bar stool endlessly to someone, to somebody who tweets about it. Mm -hmm. um, in Kerry, you were using AI and, and um, automation to fill your funnel, to find out what people were saying about different things, didn't you? Yeah, just as one element, just as one source, but we're very cautious yeah. that sentiment analysis, you know, you need to understand the context in which it's said as well. Um, so we had to use a combination of, you know, the traditional focus groups, the one-on-one, -on -one, the AI future predictors, the Instagram influencers, and again, it's back to the basics of pulling together different sources of information and really being critical in terms of what actually does this mean? Does it solve the problem we defined up front? Exactly what David had said. Have we got a real problem here that does need to be solved and can we solve it? And, you know, again, using one source of information and being able to interpret it through your own eyes is misleading. Mm. It's absolutely misleading. So again, it's all different sources and then being able to land that in one human truth. That mm. takes a lot of work. It's, mm. it's you know, it's, it is the art and science. Mm. And again, it's all down to collaboration. It's all also being able to look up and look out around you, being able to have everyday conversations with everyday people. And I think having that common sense approach is absolutely critical. And just one thing I wanted to mention, because I thought David raised a good point, Peter, with regards to expressions of macro trends. I'm the same. I've worked on the same, you know, the macro trends for years and years. Convenience, health, taste, enjoyment, value. We bring in sustainability now. One of the great changes and expressions of convenience is meal kits and door-to-door -door delivery. You know, when you started off cooking 20 years ago, an average meal was, well, it was 25 years ago, was about 35 minutes. Move on 10 years, 20 minutes. Now it's 15 minutes and you have Jamie Oliver and all those going the five minute meal. But now the new convenience is deliver directly to my door. So it is all about convenience, but the expression is absolutely critical. And one thing I would say is what Grace has said is keeping an eye on the ground, you know, walking the streets, seeing what's happening. That's where those trends and insights are born. Okay, do you mind if I ask you a question that's come up on the chat there? that I see comes up a lot of the time, and I used to work in open innovation for a pharmaceutical company. People are, are often concerned that there's a kind of pariah uh, Machiavellian mentality of large companies, as if they've someone sitting in the lobby waiting for some poor unfortunate person to expunge an idea inadvertently, and suddenly they're off to the patent office to take your idea and leave you in penury yeah. while they get rich. Um, What's your experience of that? How do you, you know, people come into board B and say, I have an idea for a new crisp range or I have a, uh, could you give some reassurance to people that generally there, it, that sort of thing doesn't really yeah. happen? I suppose uh, the best example in my experience is having worked on the Foodworks program, which is a whole program that's kind of rooted in innovation. And you have lots of companies coming together um, and people having to share their ideas. And some of their ideas were at very early stages, but I think, what Foodworks tried to foster was a, a culture of collaboration. And I think to be fair, a lot of kind of starter programs like that do foster that and people learn that it's much better to share and that you learn from each other. Uh, so you have to instill that sense of confidence in people. And um, it's not to say when you get big businesses in the room that compete with each other, they don't necessarily want to share their secrets. But um, I think when you're a, a, 
people see the potential benefit of collaborating. And I think one area where we're seeing that emerge is actually in the area of sustainability now as an example where lots of businesses have to adopt their packaging um, it's a real challenge to do it alone. You know, if you're trying to change your film or get a new material, uh, it requires working together. So you've got the CEOs of Coca-Cola, the Unilever's all coming together to say, we need to collaborate to solve these problems. So collaboration is definitely some sort of micro theme out there in the world of business right now, I think. I don't know whether you agree with me or not, guys, but. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. I certainly, yeah. sustainability is bringing people together. I suppose, Peter, if the question is, is there a sinister sort of uh, manipulative component to all of this from a big business perspective. Of course, they're there to make profit first and foremost. So uh, it's yeah. going to be part of the equation. However, I do think that particularly brand businesses that own brands, as opposed to contract manufacturer and so on, who are much more reactive and have to adhere, you know, respond to briefs and so on. But those who um, own brands are having now more than at any point in the past having to respond to what consumers need for their survival. Mm -hmm. There is significant pressure, obviously, on margins within supply chains, but also if you look at the proliferation of private label, the speed at which brands, um, you know, initiatives and innovations are copied and copied invariably at a lower cost, like brands are really having to listen to consumers and having to take much more of a genuine interest in its way agencies like Aideens and mine and so on exist is to try to give them that connection to consumers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, somebody's talked about that, about the value to existing brands. But if you looked at, say, uh, a brand that really rode the way from zero to hero, uh, fulfill, and uh, certainly when I was in GSK, if we had a, an, an idea for a toothpaste or something like that, we could test it under different brand names. Say, is this a, like a $20 million brand with Aquafresh? Is it how much would Colgate make if they, if they put this out there? But it's intriguing that the big brands that you'd expect to be in that space, like Cadbury's and Mars, have not really been able to crack that insight around protein and nutrition, well-being and energy and stuff in a way that, I mean, and therefore there's been a proliferation of totally new and relatively unknown brands have come in to fill the space. Well, I think, I think there, there are, there's loads of, st loads of things in that. Again, there's some great reports that I was involved with in the whole area of sports nutrition. But I think the, the thing that really fulfill absolutely cracked was the identification of a problem that you know, ordinary people wanted the benefits of protein bars, but they weren't going to gyms and going to places like that, didn't feel comfortable doing so. So their innovation wasn't so much in product, albeit that they had great tasting products and so on. Mm -hmm. It was a channel innovation. They were the first to get on to the shelf beside the dairy milks and caramellos and so on, where people could then be confronted with a forced choice there's a known need there um, that they identified, but then they could see it as an alternative to a chocolate bar. And prior to that, uh, protein bars, if you think back uh, yeah. in your memory, prior to Fulfill getting onto the shelf, and they were former Cadbury executives, as far as I know, so they may have had the in, in within the retail channel. That was the real innovation there, was the channel, not necessarily the product, albeit that the product was great. Yeah. Okay. So they, were solving, they were solving a different problem. They were solving a problem of access while responding to the same need as lots of the other established players like Columbia Nutrition, Kerry Nutritional, uh, and so on. Some of the biggest players in the world are Irish based on producing these protein products, but they didn't. They weren't first to get into the retail channel beside the dairy milks. And that was the difference. Okay, thanks a million, David. Um, we've just it won't wind up. Any any final thoughts that you'd like to share? I would just go around to each of you, Grace. Anything you'd um, like to? I was just going to pick up on um, what Aideen was saying. Another really important point, just when you're looking at insight that you raised, that it's it is all about stepping out of bias because when you're you know particularly as a researcher, you you can get bogged down in your world. You have to absolutely step back. Mm. Uh, it's a really really critical point. Yeah. And I, I just I'd add to that, you know, you're in 
rubbish in, rubbish out. That's mm. always a simple equation of good research and good insight. And also the answer you get is only as good as the question you ask. You know, mm. so the onus is on us as mm. researchers, as insight people to be well tooled, well equipped and well skilled to do really, really good work. And that's the one key message that I, I suppose I always hold close to my heart whenever I'm doing any good new projects, and especially in food, you know, really is important. And ju uh, just uh, from my perspective, in response to Patrick Kaplan's question there at the very end, you know, is there a limiting factor to the value of insights? There is. And, you know, quite often uh, businesses hang on to an insight for too long. Mm. So, and, and often when they get violent agreement around the boardroom table, a fear of challenging it comes into play and they pursue an insight rather than changing it and admitting that it's wrong. So I think there is a limitation on the value of it, particularly you have to think about their continuing relevance over time and keep not use it as an opportunity to say, we've cracked the insight, now we can stop thinking for a while. You have to keep thinking. Yeah, and that's where trends are really useful. You know, if you apply the discipline of thinking, embedding a trends culture, it forces you to always be thinking what's happening next, what's happening next. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, it just falls to me uh, on behalf of the university and the uh, dot lab and on behalf of the, the audience uh, and myself to thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to speak. And I feel uh, it's not often you come away after lunch thinking, feeling highly charged and really stimulated with new ideas and new ways of looking at things. And it's great to get um, your perspectives on these things. If you do them for a living, you're looking at them from some of the largest companies in the world. So really thanks a million for sharing them with us. And, and to the audience, I think uh, this will be made available to you and details of that will be on the website. So Grace, Aideen and David, thank you very much indeed on behalf of DCU. Pleasure. Thank you. It was great well, to be here with you. everyone. And thanks everybody for joining. Tomorrow, um, if I may remind you, we have some of our own stars in Professor Theo Lynn and uh, my colleague Pierre Angelo Rosati talking about once again about um, digital transformation and it promises to be a splendid session too. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.